tonight's speaker is not that guy. That's a very famous scientist, Seymour Benzer, and I don't mean in any way to make fun of him. He founded several disciplines within biology because he was just tremendously uh, brilliant and also tremendously uh, uh, courageous, We're able to drop one whole line of research and pick up something brand new and actually do groundbreaking work in it. But when most of you think about a Drosophila geneticist, this is sort of the picture we get. The characteristics are the balding pate. <laughs> it's certainly true that most Drosophila geneticists are males, middle-aged males if they're you know, far along in the field. Uh, the lab coat. I have no idea if Seymour Benzer ever actually wore a lab coat, except when the photographer got there. This is what most scientists are pictured as. And the other thing that's perfectly typical about him as a Drosophila geneticist is he's holding a model of an organism that's pictured down there in the lower left. That's Drosophila melanogaster, the common lab fruit fly that's been the genetic model system for the last century or so, both in the genetic age and now in the genomic age. It's the first insect whose genome was uh, sequenced. And by and large, Drosophila geneticists know that species and that species only among Drosophila and their entire contact with its ecology is that it grows in a bottle. And this is where tonight's speaker differs from standard Drosophila genom uh, geneticists and genomicists in that she is what's called an ecological geneticist, a person who studies the genetics of organisms in their ecological context and tries to figure out how their genomes have evolved to face the challenges provided by the environments in which they live. So this is sort of the kind of scientist that Gary Larson modeled in his old Far Side comic strips. And uh, tonight's speaker looks a little different. She sent me this picture from her field site last fall. Uh, it's not entirely clear why somebody marches out into the desert with a machete. It's certainly not to fight their way through the tight vegetation. Uh, indeed. Some of Dr. Marka's favorite study organisms are what's known as cactophilic or cactus-loving Drosophilus that instead of uh, invading rotting fruit, uh, invade the rotting pads of cacti. So I have two theories on the machete. One is that she's hacking away at rotten cactus to get at her study organisms. And the other is that we were having a fairly strident debate about what it is she was to teach in my department. <laughs> and it could have been a veiled threat. <laughs> So uh, tonight she's going to present a, a lecture on her studies of uh, desert organisms. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Marco now. Wow, thank you for that introduction, Josh. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a newcomer to uh, San Diego. I just moved here from University of Arizona last summer um, to this wonderful institution, UCSD, where I've got fabulous colleagues and um, nice connections, obviously, with facilities like this, um, and an opportunity to uh, talk about my work with people uh, from the public. And um, I'm going to do that uh, tonight and talk about um, the organisms that live in the desert that um, I'm very much interested in and have been working on for some time. Here's an overview of the talk. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about deserts and um, some of their features. I'm going to mention some aspects of insects, and then I'm going to talk about insects in deserts and um, some of the things that they're confronted with uh, that they have to deal with in, in order to survive in, in deserts. So deserts happen to occupy um, about a third of the Earth's surface. And we define a desert as uh, an area that receives less than 10 inches of rainfall a year. Um, and we can see here that, um, at least in non-polar areas, that the deserts can be all over different continents. They can be in Australia and Africa, North America, um, and parts of Asia. And um, they can be large, they can be small. Um, but the main characteristic is that uh, they receive less than 10 inches of rainfall a year. Uh, deserts can be hot, they can be cold, um, they tend to be uh, fairly dry. So here are um, some pictures of deserts, um, particular ones. This is the Atacama Desert in South America. 
Gobi Desert in Asia, and the Great Basin in North America, which is considered to be a desert as well. And what's pretty common um, to all of these, besides seeing a lot of sand, is that you don't see a lot of plants. There's not a lot of life um, in, in deserts that's, that's large or obvious. Why are we interested in deserts, uh, besides the fact that they occupy about a third of uh, the globe, the landmass of the globe? Uh, deserts are probably going to be expanding um, in the future due to a number of different reasons. One is the average global temperature is increasing. Um, I think most of us believe this, that there is in fact global warming going on. Um, and this is going to contribute um, to the increase in, in desertification. Other things are contributing to this as well, um, such as um, groundwater pumping and other kinds of land use change, usually associated with urbanization and agriculture, overgrazing. Um, what we can see here um, is um, a lake where, um, over time, um, we see much, much less water um, in this area. We can see here in the Aral Sea um, a boat. Um, used to be in water, but um, it's now desert. And we can see plants dying as groundwater um, decreases in, in its level. That was like Chad, by the way. So we have hot deserts in North America. And these are the ones that I'm, I'm most interested in and have been involved in studying the most. Um, most of my work has been in the Mojave Desert and the Sonoran Desert. The Sonoran Desert goes into Mexico, where I do a lot of my work. We are right here in San Diego, and probably many of you, um, in the course of traveling day trips or camping or going on different vacations or whatever, um, have been to the Mojave Desert and the Sonoran Desert. Um, they're not really very far away. Um, they're also beautiful. So the deserts are different. So in the Anza Borrego Desert, which is part of the Mojave, uh, we see that the plants are somewhat different. We see cactus here different from the Sonoran Desert. One of the main things that distinguishes these two deserts, um, besides obvious features like the plants that are growing there, different species of cacti, are yes, they both receive less than 10 inches a year of rain. But in the Mojave Desert, um, the rain comes um, during the winter and the spring. And in the Sonoran Desert, we get this um, very wonderful monsoon that occurs in uh, July and August and September. and um, it leads to different um, plant life and different animals then that are going to be associated with these plants. They're hot though, and when we can look at temperature recordings made in the Sonoran Desert, University of Arizona, and the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum, we see big fluctuations. It can get very, very cold. These are average temperatures. When we convert it to Fahrenheit, we're seeing an average of 104 degrees. That's pretty hot. Um, 122 degrees when we go out in Death Valley is an average high out there. So, so this is pretty warm. Um, some of the, the work that I like to do is actually in the middle of the summer um, when it is hot because that's when organisms are the most stressed. And I remember getting a, a comment back once on um, one of my grants from, from NSF, National Science Foundation, and one of the reviewers had commented that um, I was cruel to graduate students to make them go out in the desert um, in the summer, but um, of course, you know, they have hats and cold beer and whatever they need, so it's really, it's not so cruel. They didn't mind. We, we got the money, did the work. Um, so deserts present very extreme conditions for the organisms um, that live there, and they have to deal with this. There's not a lot of rainfall. That's one big issue, and when the rainfall does come, it's highly seasonal. So organisms have to um, adjust their, their lifestyles um, to meet that. The temperatures are high, typically, um, and that can be a much more difficult problem for organisms than low temperatures. And low humidity, dryness, um, is a major, major problem for any organism um, that's there. OK, what about insects? Let's say a few things um, about insects so that we can get into insects in the desert, the meat of the talk. It turns out that the majority of species of animals uh, in the world happen to be insects. Uh, this may not be completely to the percent accurate, but you can see that most of them are. And the other animals, um, birds, fish, um, frogs, um, mammals, things like that, are, are a much, much smaller uh, percentage. 
Insects uh, are estimated right now probably to be about four or six million species, and we've only been able to describe and identify probably only about a million of them as the tally right now. So there are tons of them. They're small, um, obviously, so um, it's difficult to go out and characterize absolutely all of them. Um, but they do a lot of different things. You know, people tend to think about insects, and um, they'll think, ick, insects. You know, they're creepy, and they crawl, and they do this, that, and the other thing. But they actually um, occupy positions at every trophic level, every position in the food web. They can be herbivores. They eat plants. So it's really important um, for cycling plant material. They serve as predators. They'll eat other insects and arthropods. Um, they can be prey themselves for birds and lizards and, and mammals um, and sometimes other insects. Um, they can be detritivores. They help in decomposing um, material and recycling um, in the biogeochemical uh, cycle. They can be pollinators and they can also be hosts for parasites and they can transmit diseases. So they have all different kinds of roles. And um, insects that do all of these different kinds of things are, in fact, found um, in deserts. Now, insects typically are small. We know that. But um, there are a few that are very big. This is um, something called a giant weta. And the giant weta is found in New Zealand. It's a big honking cricket. You could wrap this in a tortilla. Um, and make a taco out of it. It's very, very big. And then here's a little um, hemipter, and it's by no means the smallest insect, but it does give you a sense of the size range. Um, but even the really big insect is not very big. It's quite, quite small. One of the things that is um, an issue for insects, because they are small, is their surface to volume ratio. So this peccary, this collared peccary, or javelina, is also an organism that we find in the desert. But we can see that its body is much bigger than the insect. And what happens as you increase size is the amount of your surface area compared to the volume of your body um, changes such that it's much smaller in relation to, um, to the body content. And it has a very, very big impact on um, what we call water relations uh, for an organism. And what we see is that as size goes up, water loss through evaporation is not going to be um, as big a problem. So you have organisms that have a very, very um, unfavorable surface to volume ratio. And they can lose water very, very easily in a dry, especially a hot, dry sort of environment. Um, but as their body mass increases because of the surface to volume ratio difference, um, they don't have the problem with, with water loss. So insects, being small, are particularly subject to this problem. OK. So what about insects in the desert and how they deal with these different kinds of problems? And we'll talk about some examples here. So the biggest problem in the desert for anybody, whether it's a plant, an insect, any other kind of organism, is finding the water. Where's the water? Um, well, water's going to be in plants, um, at least concentrated in plants in a desert. And it turns out that cacti, being large, fleshy sorts of plants, tend to be uh, the place where the majority of the water tends to be above surface. So if we look out at this landscape of some Sonoran desert where we see all of these saguaro cacti, um, they tend to be about 85 90% water, depending upon the time of the season, when there was a recent rainfall, how much they've, they've absorbed. But this is where the water is. It's mighty dry in between those cacti. Organisms can identify and, and associate with these cacti in order to um, to obtain water to live. But in order to do that, they have a problem. Because most of these cacti contain very toxic chemicals. And any organism that's going to be able to use a cactus um, to eat for a breeding site or whatever is, is going to be confronted with these toxic chemicals. So um, there are a lot of things that, that have to be, be dealt with here. It turns out, though, that if we look at, at a cactus, that we find that a whole bunch of different arthropods, insects and arachnids, spiders and mites and things like this, 
um, actually make their homes in there and they're able to do it. And they're able to do it because they've developed a lot of mechanisms um, that enable them to do it. But we see this beautiful Ololepta beetle here and a surfid fly and this fabulous pseudoscorpion. He's a predator. Um, mites, all different kinds of creatures um, live in here and um, they all have similar problems to deal with. Fortunately, of the 60 or more insect species that are known to be associated with cactus tissue, using it to feed and breed, um, four of these species happen to be members of the genus Drosophila. Um, they're not Drosophila melanogaster like you saw in the um, photo of Seymour Benzer. Um, they're not the standard workhorse of um, genetic model systems, but um, they are specialists on different kinds of cactus and one of them now does have a genome sequenced. Um, Drosophila fortunately represent one of the leading model systems for studying genetics, for studying adaptations, for studying evolution and um, it's fortunate that some of the organisms that live in these cacti and live in the desert are Drosophila because we can tap into um, those tools that have been developed for Drosophila melanogaster so that we can ask questions about the genetic underpinnings of adaptations to harsh environments. Here are the four species um, and the host plants that they're associated with. Drosophila mohavensis is the main fly that I work with in my lab, although um, we work with these others as well. We can study them in nature because we know that they are very tightly associated with these particular cacti. So we know that if we go to an organ pipe cactus and we see fruit flies on there of the genus Drosophila, that they're going to be Drosophila mohavensis. If we find a saguaro and we find fruit flies associated with that saguaro, we know that those are either going to be Drosophila nigris paracula or Drosophila metleri. They have an interesting relationship, these two species, because this one is associated with the cactus tissue itself and Drosophila metleri is associated with the soil underneath the cactus. And Drosophila pachia is associated uh, with this Sunita cactus here. So it turns out um, that this one here is the most easy to raise and deal with, Drosophila mohavensis. So the first, as, as Josh or someone had mentioned, the first um, higher eukaryote who had higher organism, who had its full genome sequenced was Drosophila melanogaster and that was in the year 2000 and it was a big deal um, on the cover of the weekly journal Science. And then just um, over a year ago um, I was part of an effort to sequence um, 11 other genomes um, of Drosophila species that have different evolutionary relationships and uh, that was very, very informative. We have complete genome sequences for all of these now. They specialize on different kinds of plants, um, different life histories and so forth and so it provides us by having um, uh, complete genome sequences of all of these different flies, it provides us with an entree into understanding uh, how they have evolved uh, these different lifestyles. So it's, it's very exciting and we actually have a living collection of all of these flies at, at UCSD. Okay, so we can exploit these species, um, especially the desert dwelling Drosophila mohavensis because it's one of the species whose genome was sequenced. Um, and even though it's a desert dwelling fly and breeds in a cactus, we can rear it in the lab just like we can with Drosophila melanogaster and do a lot of genetic studies with it. But as I mentioned before, we can go to specific cacti and we can find that fly and we can watch what it does in nature. So it's a perfect marriage of um, ecology and natural history with, with genomics and, and uh, population genetics. Okay, how is it that insects can use these cacti? Well, they can't because the outside of a cactus has got a tough skin on it. They can't just go in and start chomping down on the cactus. What has to happen, first of all, is there has to be some sort of an injury to the plant. So somebody like this Gila woodpecker comes because he's making his nest or she's making her nest and they're carving out a hole and they peck at it. The plants are pretty resilient and they can actually heal those kinds of wounds, but sometimes they can't. Um, and what will happen when a plant is wounded in this way 
is that microorganisms can invade the damaged tissue and begin a fermentation process and the tissue then becomes soft and some of the toxins that are in the plant tissue become detoxified by the microorganisms. Not all of them do, but as the decomposition process is going on, um, volatiles are created, so alcohols and different things that um, have volatile profiles that attract particular species of flies. Another way um, that cacti can become damaged is that frequently after a rain, um, they have a very shallow root system. And one of the things that can happen if there's a lot of rain and the plants drink a lot, it's like anything else that drinks a lot, you fall over. Um, and so <laughs> they can fall over and then they can um, break open and microbes will go in and start the same process um, there. And what we see if, if this happens with um, a plant such as this saguaro is that over the course of sometimes six months or a year, if the plant can't deal with the infection, the entire plant will become necrotic and it will die. Um, but during this time, it can be um, the home for all of those different kinds of insects um, that uh, we saw in a previous picture. So this is um, the volatile plume that's given off by the cactus and the fly is honing in on it um, to come and find food um, and uh, mates and lay eggs and do things like that. So what happens is Flies will be associated with a necrotic cactus. Eventually it will dry out, like the one that we saw, and they will have to make their way through the desert, which is hot and dry, to find a new cactus and be happy there um, to undergo the next stage in, in their life cycle. Okay, so here is just an example of the Drosophila life cycle. A male and female fly uh, mate, the eggs are laid, we go through different larval instars and we get a pupa that's like a butterfly cocoon and then an adult will come out. And all of those stages take place right here on this necrotic cactus tissue. So this is an organ pipe cactus. These are Drosophila mohavensis. This is the juice that's coming on the outside and they're gobbling it up like little pigs. They really like it. Um, and those are their nutrients. And Usually they do their mating and courtship on another part of the cactus where the food isn't. This is not one of the species um, like some other Drosophila, such as Drosophila melanogaster, where they actually um, do their courtship and mating, what we say, at the restaurant. Here they do it um, on another part of the, of the cactus. But it, it is a way to meet, right? <laughs> um, Here's a cactus that had fallen down, and um, one of my former graduate students, Sergio Castrezano, and I are um, picking larvae out of this um, to take them back um, probably to uh, some camp or hotel or wherever we were staying in that field trip and get these larvae out, and then you can, you can rear flies from this. You can do analyses of, of the tissue and um, ask different kinds of questions about what, what they're dealing with. Okay, so they were living in there while it was becoming like that. Okay, so here are the main three challenges that um, I want to just talk about how these insects deal with. And Drosophila um, are really our model to get an insight into what's going on in other insects. We don't know if the other insects are doing exactly the same things to deal with these different kinds of stressors. But this is an insect that, because we have a genome for it and we can do genetic manipulations in the lab as well as laboratory studies, um, we can ask questions about this of Drosophila and then um, eventually hope to apply these um, answers to other, uh, other organisms. So high temperature is a problem, low humidity, dryness is a problem. And then because they avoid these problems by going in a cactus with its chemicals, they have to detoxify uh, the chemicals in the resources. Okay, high temperatures. So how, how do flies and other insects deal with this? Well, it is possible to go out and actually measure what the temperatures are inside of a cactus, a little necrotic patch or on the outside of the cactus. There are little things called hobo data loggers. They're the size of a matchbook and you can um, measure over a very long period of time, they will record um, temperature and humidity. And then you can download this into a computer 
Um, you can attach to these little hobos also little probes that go in and, and be getting data from multiple places. Um, here are some hobo data that um, came out of a saguaro cactus in Tucson in February over a period of several days and you can see that the temperatures um, this isn't centigrade but this goes way up and we're talking about going over 100 degrees it drops very quickly so they're really confronted with pretty rapid changes not only extremes but pretty rapid changes in the temperature extremes so what do they do because we know that at those really high temperatures those are temperatures at which they they often can't can't survive just being out in those temperatures and it certainly is a problem if things are dried out here and they have to get to a new place they have to disperse um, and so what they do um, behaviorally is they just wait until the early morning or nighttime to do their feeding and breeding and they will disperse at night instead of during the daytime um, just in order to avoid the, the high temperatures and we see that's, that's true of a lot of organisms um, that are out, out in the desert other kinds of adaptations are a little bit less obvious and we have to look at these in the laboratory so you know what is it exactly about high temperatures that kills organisms why why do things fall apart why do things get all messed up um, at high temperatures well one one problem is that the reactions that go on inside of a body of an insect or a person or anyone um, really are dependent on enzymes um, converting one substance to another and moving things around you know making making things breaking things down carrying on metabolism in a normal way and enzymes really are nothing more than proteins but um, every enzyme has got a very particular configuration that enables it to perform its function properly and what happens um, when it's when it's hot is that enzymes will do what we call denature so we see here this might be the normal structure for this enzyme it's just a cartoon of it that it's folded in a certain way but if it's stressed by heat it may unfold to the point where it can no longer do its job and if this is happening to a lot of enzymes we have major problems um, but we have another step that can come in here is that in response to heat cells make things called heat shock proteins HSPs and these HSPs over here um, are also referred to as molecular chaperones they are specialists at finding a protein that's abnormal and they can go to it and they can attach to it and they can restore it to its normal function okay um, and so what we see we're able to show in, in desert drosophila that yes this happens we get these this step going on yes this happens this all happens but but it happens a little bit differently for one thing the enzymes in the desert drosophila can stand a much higher temperature before they unfold before they denature so there are things about the sequences of those the amino acid sequences of those proteins that have changed that have adapted to make them more resistant um, at higher temperatures to this unfolding okay and we can see this when we compare them to um, the same proteins for flies from colder climates but the other thing that's interesting about these heat shock proteins HSPs is that in order for them to be turned on in response to a heat stress that's expensive for an organism there are costs to doing that and so you don't want to do that unless you really need it and so what we find in, in desert drosophila is that the actual temperature at which those are turned on is higher um, than for organisms from cooler climates so they're not just turning them on when they don't absolutely have to so it's kind of a, a two-part system that allows um, metabolism to keep going in a normal way in, in desert flies so 
We can study and we are studying what's the nature of changes in enzymes. We can look at selective profiles on, on proteins and, and the gene sequences that, that encode them um, and look at the production of these heat shock proteins. But these things are important for a couple of reasons, not just, you know, yes, we're interested in the flies and it's intrinsically interesting. But when we see global warming um, and we see the effects of global warming on biodiversity, it's going to be uh, very important for organisms to be able to do what these desert drosophila are doing, to be able to, to adapt in these, in these same ways so that they can survive if it gets higher um, in temperature. Um, another interesting thing about heat shock proteins is that because they recognize abnormal proteins, um, we know that they have a function, they have a role in humans um, and other mammals in uh, cancer and aging and the abnormal kinds of proteins um, that are produced um, in the course of those biological processes. So if we can understand more about these heat shock proteins and um, what they're doing, how they work, and so forth, it actually has relevance for a whole suite of different uh, human health issues. Okay, what about low humidity? Um, I moved here from, from Arizona where the humidity was very, very low. And um, after I'd been here for, I don't know, a month or two, and I went back to visit my previous lab and colleague and to do some field work um, in the desert, I just, I felt extremely dried out. I had not really adapted to this and I was, you know, noticing I was constantly putting on lotion and so forth where I hadn't noticed it so much before. Um, and insects are, are no different. Um, when, when we look with our hobos again at um, different places in a cactus, inside of a cactus, outside of a cactus, we can actually see that there's a very big difference in relative humidity. So the relative humidity inside of a cactus is much, much higher. Well, that would be good for an insect, wouldn't it? Um, especially if you had a problem with water loss because of your surface to volume ratio, um, because it's much drier outside. But when we look at the temperature on the inside or the outside of the cactus, we find that um, inside where it's more humid, it's actually hotter and we're getting closer to temperatures that are not so great for them. So they have to do um, different kinds of things to fine tune their ability to be out there and, and to function in the desert. When we look at human skin and compare it to insect skin, uh, we see some similarities. So here for our skin, if we want to um, keep ourselves moist, well, we can go out and we can buy carry lotion or Cetaphil or something and smear it on our skin, right? And, and really what it is, it's, it's an oil, you know, it's, it's, it's a lipid. We put it on there and it keeps things from, from evaporating. So an insect um, actually has similar mechanisms except they don't go um, to Rite Aid to buy their, um, their stuff to smear on them. Um, it turns out that in this upper layer of an insect skin, um, something called the epicuticle, that uh, is the place where different kinds of oils lipids reside that actually waterproof um, the insect. They reside in the epicuticle, they're made uh, down below in lower layers and they're deposited up there. And when we think about these lipids, um, these fats, oils, waxes, which are all part of the same family of molecule, um, we can think about them in kind of a simple way. Um, really what they are, these fatty acids, are chains of carbons with different hydrogens sticking off of them. And they tend to um, increase in length by units of two. Um, butter, for example, has got four carbons in the chain. Um, you can move all the way on up to things like olive oil and so forth, and you can have saturated different bonds and situations. We don't need to go into that because the, the point here is, is that Depending upon the length of this chain, they have different properties, um, the fats and the oils. So for example, if we look at the melting points um, of different chain lengths, so here we go from 10 all the way to 18, and we look at the melting points 
we see that they actually increase with the length of the chain. So when we go to look at the oils, the lipids that are associated with the cuticle of insects, we find a very interesting thing. If you look at Drosophila, for example, that don't live in the desert. This is true of other insects as well. It's not just Drosophila, but those from more temperate regions. Um, and we look at the number of carbons in the chains um, that we see in the lipids in, in their skin, in their epicuticle. You know, it's, it's usually a cocktail of them, and they range from about 10 to 22 carbons in length. But when we go and do the same analysis, on insects from the desert, most of it we've done on, on Drosophila from the desert, is we see things that are up to 40 carbons um, in length. And this is a very good way for them to waterproof themselves with um, lipids that don't have a, a very low melting point so that they can really tolerate the heat and they can keep the water in. Okay, that was one way that they do it. Um, there's another interesting thing that we had discovered in our lab. Um, one of the things that we, we do a lot of work on is, is insect reproductive, reproductive biology, behavior, um, fecundity, fertility, things like this. So we're constantly mating flies in the lab and looking to see what happens to mated flies. And one of the experiments that we did was to take flies that were mated, um, virgin flies, mate females with a male, keep some that were not mated, and then put them in a desiccation chamber where we were able to control the humidity, keep it down to about 2%, and count the dead flies every hour, how many of them were dying. And we found um, an interesting thing, is that in desert species, and this is just based on females here, what we found was is that mating actually increased the, the longevity of the females. When we look at non-desert flies, we actually see a slight decrement in longevity. These are not necessarily significant differences, but there's definitely a pattern here, and many of these differences are highly significant. So mating appears to help uh, these Drosophila females resist desiccation. They can live a lot longer if they've mated. Well, what's going on here? Um, so with non-desert Drosophila, we see a pair of flies down here. Um, they're in love, they're mating. Um, and what happens internally in the female when we have copulation is that seminal fluid goes into her reproductive tract. These insect females have reproductive tracts that are not unlike humans. They've got two ovaries. Um, uh, a uterus and so forth. And one big thing that's different is that these insects have a sperm storage organ, um, which humans don't have. But nonetheless, sperm floating inside of seminal fluid is deposited in the reproductive tract of these females. Non-desert species, it stays right there in the reproductive tract. When we look at this in our desert cactophilic species, what we see is something very different. We see significant amounts of the fluid actually going out into the female's bloodstream and uh, ending up in her ovaries, in her somatic tissues, and so forth. Um, and we feel this is probably what's enabling her to survive because we can actually correlate the amount that um, she gets with how long she can survive. Now, interestingly, in these desert species, um, well, in the non-desert species, when, when males mate with females, we see males passing approximately oh, maybe 0.1% of their body weight to the female. But um, from the desert species, males actually, on a given mating, transfer about 3% of their body weight to the female. So just by way of reference, if you were to think about a 200-pound man, um, six pounds. So um, this is a generous thing. Um, anyway, so females are able to survive. We haven't looked at the cost of males, um, two males yet, but it doesn't look like it's costing them a lot in terms of their survival. Okay, so for the last, um, the last challenge that they face it has to do with toxic chemicals in these dietary resources. The cactus tissue contains 
as I said before, a whole suite of different things, um, glycosides, cardiac glycosides, tannins, phenolics, things that are, that are really awful. And if you take Drosophila melanogaster and you put it um, on cactus food, they die, they look like this. But cactophilic Drosophila, when you feed them cactus from these desert flies, they're just fine. Okay? They turn into nice healthy pupae and you get um, nice adults growing out of it. So how do they deal with this? Well, they have, um, they have differences in a couple of families of genes that are involved in detoxification. And without becoming too, too you know, technical talking about it, there are really two different families of these genes. One are things called cytochrome P450s, and the others are glutathione transferases. And um, P450 or GST, um, are the abbreviations for these, and these are families of genes. It's not just one gene. So of P450s, you know, there can be hundreds of these, same for GSTs, and most organisms have got them and have got a number of them, and they deal with different kinds of toxic chemicals. So we can study these um, in Drosophila. So if we, for example, are to take a cactus breeding species, and we grow it on a piece of cactus in the lab, what we get is healthy adults. If we take a non-cactus species, such as Drosophila melanogaster, and grow it on cactus, we don't get adults. We get what I showed you before, a bunch of dead, um, bunch of dead larvae. They just don't make it. They're poisoned by it. Okay. But it's possible um, to make flies what we call transgenic and to actually move certain detoxification genes, a P450 gene or a GST, move it into um, one of these flies that normally wouldn't have that gene and ask, is this the one that's going to be um, useful in having flies survive? And yeah, um, we can actually um, see this and look at this and do these manipulations. So we know that these detoxification genes have changed evolutionarily to allow flies um, to live in these toxic environments such as, as the cacti. There's another whole suite of flies that, that grow in mushrooms that have um, toxins in them and they deal with things in, in a slightly different way. Um, but this is something that they do. So detoxification genes are actually of interest not just um, to someone like me who wants to know why can flies live in the desert and breed in cactus, but it turns out that these same genes are involved in the evolution of pesticide resistance. So a lot of work has been done on this actually um, for DDT, for example, DDT resistance in malarial mosquitoes. It turns out that one of the GSTs um, genes has been, has been shown to be responsible for um, associating with, with DDT resistance in mosquitoes. So a lot of work has been done on it and, and the fly work can actually exploit that to, to better study the changes in these genes. So insect pests um, for you know, disease vectors, agricultural pests, this, these are important genes for, for biocontrol. Um, the other thing that's interesting is when, when you think about cancer-causing chemicals in, in humans, the things that we're exposed to that we know, you know have a very high, um, present a high risk for, for developing cancer, if you're exposed to them, these same compounds that are in the flies are responsible for uh, surveillance and getting rid of and detoxifying those things. Um, in humans and, and other organisms. And so understanding how they work and how they evolve to meet different challenges in the flies can be very useful um, for studying this in, in man. And the other um, place where they interface with, with things like cancer and other um, human health problems where, where people are receiving chemotherapy is that the chemicals that we take um, to uh, try to knock out cancer are often horrible, toxic things themselves. And so um, these same gene products, the P450s and the GSTs, can actually interfere with the chemotherapy that people would be receiving for some sort of a disease because that's their job, is to, to be surveillant for these kinds of um, chemicals and detoxify them. So, so there are a lot of reasons to study these um, in Drosophila because they do have a lot of, a lot of relevance um, for humans.
Okay, so um, in summary, I just want to remind people that insects that are endemic to the desert um, are faced with serious problems. Um, in order to deal with the heat and the dryness, they've been able to exploit uh, cacti because that's where all the water is, but in doing so they've had to deal with a lot of toxins uh, and they have recruited different genetic systems to deal with those toxins, um, which can be very, very um, useful um, to study for a lot of different reasons. Um, they have very unique uh, adaptations that allow them to deal with the heat and the dryness and uh, and the detoxification issues. And you know, as, as I've showed you a few of these, there are others as well that we didn't have time to go into. So these are important for the flies that, that I've come to know and love, but I think they also have, uh, the processes, the mechanisms have very big um, contributions to make um, to understanding biodiversity, possibly preventing its loss in the face of global change, and also, I think they have huge potential uh, for research on, on human diseases. Thank you. What, what, is the, what is the seminal fluid doing exactly to make them more resistant? Um, well, I think for one thing, it, it's fluid, so it's liquid. So they're probably bulking up their reserves. Um, by, a, you know, some percent. Um, it also, it turns out, it's very nutrient rich. Um, it's full of proteins and carbohydrates, and so it may actually be um, providing some some real benefit at that level besides just liquid. So the question was, um, I showed the the seminal fluid as. Um, a ball in the cartoon of the reproductive tract, is it acting as a plug? Um, in this species, Drosophila mohavensis, the desert, one of the desert flies, there is a plug-like um, structure that forms, but it actually looks like it's formed by the female around the seminal fluid. So, so would that then, do you think that has a contributing factor in terms of the, like, the their resistance to low humidity environments, like they're not desiccating, you know, because they've got a plug. Yeah, it, the question is, are, are they not desiccating because they have a plug? Um, well, maybe, but other desert species that don't get a plug also um, are not desiccating. So uh, it, it could be a combination. I, I think, I do think that it's probably the fact that, so we can, we can actually, use radioisotopes to label males and then track the radioactive substances that they pass to females and in those species it ends up throughout their somatic tissue, their body tissue, and I think it, it's just beneficial. The plug is still there, but it's more than just that. So the question has to do with the fate of the seminal fluid um, when it goes into the female. Um, the seminal fluid, some of it does stay with the sperm in the sperm storage organs. Probably there's something nutritive in there for the sperm to keep them alive and, and wiggling and um, till the female's ready to use them. The rest of it that goes across uh, the female's reproductive tract and enters the rest of her body looks to be just part of her metabolism as if it was food that came from her diet and is used in, in her tissue and, and metabolic pathways. Yes, it's, and I think it's, it's, it's a good question. So the question has to do with um, what are the prospects um, of using the research with Drosophila heat shock proteins, HSPs, that recognize you know, peculiar abnormal proteins uh, with respect to dementia. And um, I think that, um, you know, it's not a field that I know a huge amount about. I do know that there are multiple kinds of HSPs and that um, they are turned on in response to different kinds of stress, that they recognize different kinds of abnormalities. They, they are specialized among themselves. Um, there is evidence 
that they may be useful in terms of detecting proteins that are abnormal associated with aging. Um, how much of that is in the nervous system and how much has been done, I don't, I don't know. But I suspect it, it should be a fruitful area for research and I think it should hold a lot of promise. Um, the question had to do with uh, the, the long um, carbon chains that are in the cuticles of desert organisms to waterproof them and so forth. And um, do we know the gene for that? Um, and can we put it in other organisms? Um, the gene is involved in fatty acid synthesis and um, most of these organisms have it. We don't really understand yet why um, why they're longer. If it's that the reaction that adds, you know, these doublets of carbons on goes on longer, um, you know, or what, it's, it's probably something regulatory, but we don't quite understand it yet. Perhaps when we do, we could, we could make some transgenic insects. What are the applications going to be? Well, so what are the applications of the work for global change? Well, I think that, that if we're talking about global warming, um, global drying, and we can, we can understand, starting with one species, what are the various kinds of genetic mechanisms that can um, enhance survival and resistance to those stressors, and then look at the next Drosophila species, and maybe a few other species. If we can find some commonality to the mechanisms, or maybe things that are unique to certain organisms, it's possible if those things are genetically variable in a group of organisms that you could select for it. Or you could, if you could actually identify the mechanisms, you might be able to use some sort of transgenic approaches to enhance survivability of organisms. Those are things off the top of my head. Yes, I, I think you could see it from, move from smaller species to larger species because many of the um, the families of genes, many of the metabolic pathways are the same in all organisms, where you, whether you're talking about a higher vertebrate or, or an insect. And so I think there's a lot of cross applicability. Yeah. So the, the question is um, having to do with the heat shock proteins being turned on um, at different temperatures and um, what controls that. It, it is regulatory, probably. Um, and the regulatory mechanism is going to be what's going to be sensitive um, to the temperature. It might be different in different types of tissues. It, it's all going to be at the cellular level because it's all happening intracellularly. So it would be something going on in, you know, in the nucleus of a particular cell. And whether that would be different in a, in a nervous system tissue or ovarian tissue or skin it probably is, but I don't, I don't know. So it's not that the nervous system tells the organism, uh, it's hot now, every, all the heat shock protein should come on. It's, it's the yeah. issue. Yeah, well, no, I think, you know, your nervous system certainly responds to heat. I mean, we've got a, a central mechanism for that, but, but cells do as well. So if, if, if um, things are breaking down, inside of a cell if they're denaturing, that sends a signal as well at a cellular level. Okay, so, so the question is, um, is, is the, the chain link something that's genetically hardwired or um, is it something that can change if you rear the flies under different conditions? Um, it is genetically hardwired, so after one or two generations of doing that, you wouldn't see much change. But if you start with a population of organisms, there's going to be genetic variability in that group. And so um, you can actually select for, you know, what we would call it artificial selection in a laboratory, where you could actually directly try to bring about um, shorter chains, and, and I'm sure you would get a response. Um, it, it, it certainly can happen over a long period in a laboratory, but it, but it is characteristic of a species. Um, but, it, but it can change, just like you, know, you get a new species as part of an evolutionary process. All right, let's uh, thank Dr. Markow again for a talk.
Thank you.